Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, the first Funk Prog Sweden this year, 2024. And as always, we would like to welcome back all recurring viewers. Welcome back to New Year and the New Year of Functional Programming and meet the meetup, Funk Prog Sweden. Warm welcome. And also, <laughs> we would also like to welcome all our new viewers to Funk Prog Sweden. Funk Prog Sweden is the meetup where you learn about functional programming and functional programming languages and functional programming thinking. With that, let's head over to today's agenda. Soon. No! Hey! First, I'll do a short intro and then we'll head over to Janet and her nice presentation. Functional design, applying past software architecture and design to our closure programs. But first, we would like to thank Ada Beat for sponsoring this video stream. If you're interested and want to know more about Ada Beat, head over to their webpage, adabeat.com, or check them out on social media. The schedule for the coming year then. Now we are, of course, 16th of January. We're here. 13th of February. We'll be back with another meetup on live here from the studio in Stockholm and then 12th of March we will be at Kibra this is a preliminary date hopefully we can set and finalize that date so if you're in Stockholm 12th of March come and head over to the Kibra office and meet us there and then in April we'll be back with another uh, meetup of course and then as always we'll run one meetup per month in the coming year if you want to support the Funk Prog Sweden community, which you of course want to do, and you want to meet other people and say hello to them, head over to the meetup and join us there to not miss anything. Also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And finally, last but not least, head over to meetup or to YouTube and you can find the link to the Discord server also. And if you have longer questions, sometimes YouTube doesn't allow for questions that are too long in the YouTube chat, just head over to the Discord server and shoot away questions. Which, if you have questions, do use the chat or the Discord server. So with that, let's start. Welcome Janet to Funk Prog Sweden. Thanks, Magnus. Oh, thanks, and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden. The stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you for coming to my talk. Thank you for having me. This is functional design um, with closure. And uh, yes, I know it's not December 19th. Uh, that was the first time I gave this talk. But first, a bit about me. Um, <clears throat> I'm an independent closure consultant. And I have years of professional closure and closure script experience. I started messing around with functional programming like 12 years ago. Uh, I have a blog about Twitter that people seem to like. I talk a lot about the stuff that I'm about to talk about today there. Um, I also talk about that same stuff on Twitter. Uh, you can find me around the internet, most places at Janet A. Carr. Um, yeah, and my latest project is this course called Closure for Pros. It is a course for professional software developers who want to use and learn closure at their day job. So functional design, uh, what does that mean? So the architecture and design of software with functional programs, a functional programming paradigm. And this is not to be confused with the Uncle Bob's book on functional design, which I which I wrote the foreword for. Um, but there's some overlap there. Yeah, so before we get into the deeper stuff, I want to talk about the functional design basics. And this is I these are probably pretty obvious for most of the viewers here. But I want to cover them because I think they're important. Uh, so that's recursion over looping, functions over objects, and transformations over instructions. So
so recursion over looping. Uh, obviously, we have recursion. In closure, we have the loop form, um, but this is not really any different than recurs recursion in other programming languages. Um, but we get two models of iteration, or we get two important things from recursion. We get a model of iteration, and we get a reoccurring, rebinding lexical scope, which is a fancy way of saying we get function parameters for each recursive call. Now we can use recursion to rebuild something like this. So this is a classic reduce in closure. Uh, as you can see, a reduce is just, it collapses a collection into a single value using a function. So, um, and of course the basis for reducers is the higher order function. So we can use function composition instead of object composition uh, using higher order functions. That is functions are first class citizens. I think we probably all know that here at Funkprog. Uh, and ideally we would have pure functions instead of side effects. But now we can combine the reduce from the previous slide with a higher order function or a callback function. We can create reducers. We can create a reducer here. We can recreate the classic map operation. Uh, you can see my mapper at the bottom here. And you can see that I've contrasted it with map. So map map inc range 7 those are closure core functions so i'm just contrasting it with what comes with closure out of the box so this kind of creates a paradigm shift in the way that we write functional programs essentially a functional program is i like to think well i like to think of um a functional program as a series of transformations on data instead of a series of instructions the computer executes. And yes, I I definitely lifted that from Learn You a Haskell for great good uh, for any of the Haskell fans out there. And so usually we chain these reducers, these transformations together, uh, in a sense, creating a pipeline of reducers. And then that way, because of persistent data structures, we can get around having state in our applications. So this is just the typical, the transformations I was talking about. These two statements are equivalent. Um, this is just, the bottom is closure syntactic sugar almost. It's a macro that will uh, thread the range 7 through the reducers map filter and then finally we collapse the collections or the collection sorry um, with the plus sign the addition function so the basics let us think about design principles Uh, so I'm sure if anybody has studied any kind of software engineering or even done any work in the workplace, the phrases on the left are going to be pretty familiar. Um, and probably they might even be bad words, <laughs> depending on your school of thought. But we can actually achieve most of these with the functional design basics. Uh, so the first one uh, works on my machine. That's kind of a joke. And then uh, programming to an interface, that is 100% true, actually. So I'll come back to that in a second. But when we want to use delegation, uh, we can use a higher order function instead of state input and encapsulation 
like I said in the previous slide, we can use persistent data structures. And finally, uh, we favor function composition over object composition. So what is a functional interface? Um, well, an object-oriented interface is a set of method signatures. That is the, the method parameters and its return value. Uh, so I guess the analog we can think of as a functional interface as a set of function signatures, or as I like to say, uh, a bag of uh, a bag of functions. So this means that, and notice how I didn't say there's no like interface construct here that I'm talking about specifically. A type conforms to an interface or just a bag of functions. Uh, so in functional programming or specifically closure, we can think of a type like a sequence or a list. Uh, the sequence interface, or sorry, the, a sequence conforms to the interface first, rest, and cons. And I think that's pretty typical across most uh, functional programming languages. Uh, and so naturally, this means we can substitute any type conforming to the interface for one another, or for another one, sorry. Usually you can think of this as polymorphism, uh, but it's this is a little less um, abstract than that. So in Clojure, we have a few options for polymorphic behavior, like passing around lambdas, dispatching on multi-methods or protocols. Um, but if you're using something like Haskell, uh, you probably just have plain old functions. So a couple slides ago, I mentioned delegation. I think I mentioned delegation. Uh, so this is like a very classic software design engineering concept, giving work to, you know, object delegation, giving work to another function. And then I like to say function delegation, giving work to another function. Usually uh, decoupled from the delegating code by an interface. So this really like uh, an object oriented programming, a delegate gets treated like a black box, typically according to its interface. Uh, and function delegation kind of just seems like calling a function. And it is, uh, except we're passing as an argument. I like to think the real differentiator here is that a delegate has some kind of domain or design significance. And I have to point this out because someone rightfully called me out and asked, how is this different from calling a function? Uh, so a delegate, we're going to decouple things. We can really just think of it as decoupling. Um, it's a bit abstract in that way. So I often think that um, enclosure, uh, specifically, but sometimes just functional programming in general, developers tend to discard software design of the past. And I'm not really talking about dry or solid or acronyms like that. I'm talking about understanding both your problem space and challenges posed by building a code base that can respond to change if it's needed. The word design here implies that a problem is being solved. For example, if you've ever worked with a UI UX designer, they always start with the problem the user is facing. It always starts with user conversations. So I think the same principle applies to software design. We're really solving a problem when we're designing something. 
And of course, that means, yes, I do like to talk about software design patterns. Um, right. But like, yeah, like who cares? Like, do we really need this in functional programming? Um, well, if we go back, we can tell that uh, given what we know about design, you know, a software design patterns solve a recurring problem across code bases. That's why they're cataloged and documented. I don't think people understand this facet or it's become lost in like today's culture. Uh, and so what happens is people don't understand the problem they're solving with the design pattern. And then they tend to over apply them and create more complex code, which is fair. Now, I'm not saying we should go out and learn all the design patterns to find a nail for your new hammer. Rather, I want you to try and develop an eye for the problems and then maybe use some of that uh, when you're doing functional programming. And I'm the, not the only one who thinks this, actually. Um, some, some design patterns are actually included with the closure programming language. Um, and I'll come back, I'll touch on those here in a few minutes. But first I wanna cover a very classic software design pattern uh, that I think could be used in other like functional programming languages. So that's the state pattern. Uh, if anybody's tried to model a finite state machine, it can be pretty challenging to do in code. Uh, and I've seen some pretty wonky implementations using symbolic values and, you know, go-tos or just like really bad, like just a very big chunk of, um, I guess, switch statements or con statements and closure. So the state pattern is supposed to solve this. In the, in the object-oriented world, each state object is a state in the finite state machine and only the current state knows when to transition to the next state usually by returning that next state well that's pretty easy to do in functional programming thanks to higher order functions and recursion because remember we have when we recur we have that rebinding lexical scope and so we can kind of drive forward uh, a state machine in that way. And of course, I mentioned the closure reference types here. So those are stateful types. For those of you who don't know, those are four stateful types uh, specific to closure, vars, atoms, refs, and agents. Uh, we don't really have to worry about them here, but those are actually very much like typical state stateful con constructs you might see from like, you know, impure programming languages or imperative programming languages. So I'm not gonna really like talk about those too much. Um, well, kind of in the next, next thing, but let's stick with the state pattern for now. Okay, so this is a finite state machine of an imaginary video game. And I just want to focus in here on the state, the start menu. Uh, it's our initial state with four transitions. And like I said, we can create this finite state machine with recursion and higher order functions. Now, the reason I want to focus in on this start menu state is because I couldn't fit all of the rest of the code into a slide. And I'm sorry that I know this is a bit hard to read, um, but as we can see, we use the rebinding scope in game loop near the bottom here to keep track of the current state. Each state is a function that takes the game information and returns a game state function. So essentially, the 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 signature or the same they all have the same signature, and the signature is. Uh, input to state or return state. For example, when the player collides, or in this case, clicks play game, 
we return the play game function. Play game is then bound to game state and the next call of game loop or the next recursive call in game loop. This way we can fill out the rest of the finite state diagram from the previous slide. And the really cool thing about this is that it should actually work in any functional programming language, so long as the recursion is not lazy. Uh, I like to use the example of Haskell, but I haven't played around with Haskell in a while, so. So next is the observer pattern. The problem that this solves is it, it decoupling state changes from state usage. In object-oriented programming, that means notifying a collection of observer objects. In functional programming, that means notifying a collection of observer functions. Uh, and the creator of Clojure, Rich Hickey, understood the usefulness of observers uh, since there's a programming construct in Clojure called a watch, and that's quite literally an implementation of observers, but on the closure reference types that I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, and it's like very much like if you go and look at this uh, closure source code, it is uh, the observer pattern. Um, but I think Rich Higgy understands what I'm talking about, and he called them watches because people don't like object oriented terms. So uh, but watches are basically observers. So this is this is what it looks like. Um, this is the main function of a model view controller app I made in Clojure. And you can see where it says add watch to state. So state here is one of those reference types. This is an atom. Uh, it's just an atomic reference. You can put any data there and then you can change it. So uh, I have these two functions and they observe for changes in the state. And then when they observe changes in the state, they'll update the view. Uh, but that's like, obviously it's very closure specific. So if we were brave um, or confident, we could actually add our own observers to our state machine from a couple slides ago. All we'd have to do is whenever we change state, we just have a notify function that will call probably, you know, just a map, a map over the observer functions since the observer functions all conform to the same functional interface. Um, yeah, and then this one's a little less abstract and uh, pretty straight to the point. So the strategy pattern, the problem being solved is you want to decouple an algorithm from its context. Uh, and so in object oriented programming, they just use uh, a delegate object to, you know, send off like here we want quick sort or merge sort or whatever it might be. Um, and then in functional programming, we just have a callback function or we close over the function that we want. And here's some code. This is quite literally um, based on the find function from Clojure Core. Uh, and yes, you can see it takes the sort function and it will call it. And I did not fill out my quick sort or the merge sort or the radix sort because I haven't set foot in a computer science classroom in like 10 years. So I'm sure you can imagine what those sort functions look like. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, just some pitfalls to avoid. So I'm done with the design patterns. You got you, you kind of get the idea. I don't want to like just keep going through design patterns because it's not... The point I'm trying to make here is that we're solving a problem with design. Um, yeah, so using state with the lambda can cause inconsistency in your code. Uh, you could potentially lose control of the lambda execution because you don't know where it's being passed around. 
So state with Lambda is probably not great. Probably don't have to worry about this if you're using uh, something like Haskell. Um, but monads are still a thing, so. Not naming your lambdas. If you can name your lambdas, that's the best. Um, Closure, you can actually name your lambdas. Uh, so they're not technically anonymous functions at that point. So if you can name them, or you could just, like have like a top level define for your function and just pass that around. And of course, in Clojure, naming your lambdas actually makes them recursible. Uh, so that, that also helps so if you want to I don't know, create an anonymous, or not anonymous, but semi-anonymous uh, state state pattern. Not documenting your lambdas. So lam lambdas don't usually have first class uh, like documentation. So and because you know we're we're passing around these like functions, um, it can be kind of cryptic. So I really recommend documenting with comments like a lot or you know, I'm sure your programming language has some kind of tool, but most functional programming languages don't really have some kind of first class way of documenting lambdas. Uh, yeah, and so there's a situation that this can cause where you're passing a whole bunch of lambdas instead of uh, what I like to say, podying up for a protocol. So protocol is very much like a um, a polymorphism construct enclosure for those who don't know it's kind of similar to an interface from java but not really because you're not allowed to subclass with it and there's a bunch of restrictions um it's very much like you know a bag of functions except you only have to pay uh, pass one argument instead of i don't know several functions several callback functions Uh, and of course, you know, most developers wince at doing that. Um, but I think it's well worth it uh, for the clarity in your code. Closure also has this other type called a multi method. So this is quite literally like, um, like a uh, polymorphic function in itself. This is just an implementation on Closure's part of dynamic dispatch. But you can achieve similar functionality just by having a callback function. And the last thing, uh, discarding ideas because they're too OOP or too complex or too whatever. Uh, I find that functional programmers and closurians in particular are adverse to certain decisions because they think they're not simple, but in reality, simple tr decisions turn out to be easy decisions. And those are kind of the decisions that tend to bite us in the ass later on. Yeah, and that's that's pretty much all I have here. Uh, function, I just want to quickly function interfaces and delegates. Functional design basics. Design solves the problem, including software design. And I like to think that solution scale, not programming languages. So don't be afraid to steal the solutions to existing problems, but don't ruin your code base. Uh, and, in, <laughs> and I'm sure that you saw the common theme here. In conclusion, just use a function wisely. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Uh, I'm waiting for to see if the chat, if people are going to come in with questions. In the meantime, uh, how come or how did you get into FP and Clojure? Yeah, it's kind of a long story. Um, I guess when I was a kid, I was very into this SaaS startup uh, called Remember the Milk, they were like one of the first like SaaS software as a service to-do list apps mm. back in 2005. And I kind of followed them all through university. Uh, and when I was a young computer science student, 
I would occasionally look at the job postings of different companies that I liked. And one and theirs was kind of unique. Like they talked a lot about scalable internet architecture. And they also use this weird programming language I never heard of called Scala. So I started learning Scala. I bought a book. I actually bought the two books that they had mentioned in their in their uh, job post. Uh, the thing about it was that I saw Scala as like this new age Java, and I didn't get functional programming at all. I actually had to go and learn, or I had to go learn Haskell mm. from this book called "Learn You a Haskell for Great Good," and then I kind of got it. And then I like I guess the um, the functional habit started from there. Cool. Um. We got one question here in the chat, like, uh, not familiar with FP, but don't, but do you want to, but want to know, I don't know, maybe it's just written it wrong, but don't you want to, know, how do you solve the cache problem with FP, like in the persistent state you mentioned? Do you even use a cache? Oh, that's... I mean, the, a ca using cache is, it's like two schools, use cache, don't use cache, and yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. I would say that like Clojure actually has a a really good library for this. Um it's like closure.core.cache or something like that. Mm. Um but if if you want to use a cache, like I I for this purpose I'm assuming that we're talking about a cache that's in the process, like in memory, not like a Redis cache or something like that, right? Like I we're assume, talking about assume that's what it meant, yes. Yeah. So I would just do the same like recursion thing, right? Mm. Um, mm. You know, each each transformation, you can rebind the cache. Mm. Um, and I'm not going to talk about cache invalidation because we all know how hard that is. Um, you can choose your own eviction algorithms and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that you could probably drive a cache forward doing that. Mm. Um, in other circumstances... You might be able to create some kind of monad. Now, personally, I don't. I don't reach for monads. Mm -hmm. uh, I I I think monads are really just a hack uh, to make functional programming languages actually useful instead of writing you know academic papers about them all the time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would say you could probably get away with uh, a cache either by just thinking about the execution of your program uh and maybe even yeah passing it around mm. um but closure does have reference types that you could store the cache in but by default the cache in say closure is a persistent data structure yeah so i hope that answers the question <laughs> i hope so too i think it's like a good yeah caching is really should you do it should you don't do it if you do it how should, I mean, it's a question beyond functional programming really <laughs> It's, it's yeah i mean like it's it's a component in the architecture i think yes. and i i would i would not opt to have like a cache directly in the process itself mm. um but that's just my opinion yeah yeah we got a lot okay thanks that answered the question we hope so at least <laughs> <laughs> checking the no not any i don't have any more <clears throat> questions so you mentioned how you started to work or like got into to closure. Uh, did you learn it by yourself completely or did you go to some kind of school or uni or anything else? Uh, no, I just like, I started reading this book by my friend. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Daniel Higginbotham he wrote this great book. It's called Closure for the True and Brave. Mm -hmm. You can read it online for free. Um, I actually dropped out of university to get my first closure job. Uh, and so I guess it was thanks to that book um, <laughs> and his effort. Uh, <laughs> you should drop out of university if you want to be big, big in tech. Yes. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Like, you know, all the billionaires are dropping out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. Yeah. Are there, I mean, I'm not familiar, I'm from Sweden, but is, are there many jobs in, in Canada, Toronto, where you are, that is into closure or US time zone, maybe I should mention, say? I think there were. Uh, mm. I mean, the the North American market is in quite a bind 
recently. Actually, it seems like most of the closure jobs are in Europe these days. Like if you oh. just search closure and like LinkedIn, it's they're all in like, you know, there's some in Sweden, Germany. Oh. Actually, Griffin Bank is based in Germany, I think. Yeah, uh, or Britain. I so think they, they have some kind of, at least I think they have a, like a remote scheme, Griffin, I, I heard of. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I was talking with uh, the VP of engineering there and he said they, they do like remote in Europe. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, there's like uh, the, the, the job market is in a bind in North America, but um, I, I have seen a lot of companies use closure. Actually, a couple of big companies use closure, like a, quite a few Walmart. Uh, Walmart is like this giant big box store in North America. And their data services team or something like that, they use Clojure. They have mm. for years. So it's kind of like, it's like niche, uh, obviously, like most functional programming languages. But yeah, I would say up until that. a couple of years ago, there was, <laughs> yes. there was definitely some, some good work around. Yeah. And we're trying to change so that functional pro programming becomes the norm. Like with this meetup spreading it. Yes. That would be ideal. Yeah, exactly. People are like, oh, Europe. Woo. Yeah. Otherwise, at least what I, when I, when I started to learn about closure, like four years ago, I think everyone said, go to US because <laughs> it's where all the jobs are actually. <laughs> Things change. Yeah. So um, we don't have any more questions. Again, thank you very much, Janet, for coming and doing a very nice presentation. Thank you very much again. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're my welcome, pleasure. Janet. You're welcome. Um, that was Janet Carr, and uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, to everyone, this is like the first meetup this year, and we'll come back with more meetups in, the, in February, March, April, and so forth and so on. So please stick with us, and uh, have a nice evening or a nice day, depending on where you are. Bye for now.